Okay, so um, so let's let's continue with last week. So I um, I promised to tell you something super exciting so that you all show up today. So I, I hope I deliver at least uh, half of what I intended. Uh, what I want to do is is tell you a little bit about a very general technique um, uh, of of showing how uh, much of a speed up we can have when we when we use quantum systems to compute. Um, so. The advantages are, I would say, twofold. One is that it's a very universal method, and you can actually put a general bound, which is a little bit depressing, I would say, in some sense, showing you that you cannot have an exponential speed up in general. It only tells you that it's basically something like a square root or a sixth root is the best one that you can really push. Um, but the, the, the other importance of this is, is, is basically to do with, with universality of quantum mechanics. So there is also a nice picture in which to view quantum mechanics and quantum computation. And I hope that you see that side of things. So it's not just a calculation. Like everything in physics, you know, it's not just a calculational tool. But it happens to have a soul as well. It carries a spiritual component along with it, which is why we do physics, of course. So um, to remind you, I, I was talking basically mainly about one particular uh, way of uh, thinking about uh, the difficulty, which was, I give you an oracle. And I do that just not to worry about the details of how this would be implemented in practice. So I give you some box, uh, which of course you have to worry about if you really want to implement it. But I give you some box, which typically computes some function. And it's really the properties of these functions that, that, you, want to, that you want to address. Uh, again, as we discussed before, there, you know, this is not the most general quantum question that you can ask. You can, for example, uh, get a bunch of qubits, shove it into the computer, and ask the computer, are they entangled? That kind of question does not exist within the framework. Okay? You cannot ask that. No one has even thought about it, really, how to phrase that. So I'm still talking at the classical level in the sense that some, um, you know, some, some mappings between bits and bits are given to you and now you want to figure out what kind of properties they have. Quantum mechanically, in contrast to classical physics, and that was the main, that was the main message, you basically have, um, you have an input x and you have an output which seemingly doesn't really do anything useful for you. Um, all it does it keep is, is basically encodes the function um, into, the, into the phase uh, of, of your state. And, and tomorrow you will probably see the last uh, algorithm that we will cover, Schroes algorithm, because today I want to talk a little bit about implementations. Before I hit you with something very hard and abstract, <coughs> I want to soften it up and I want to uh, basically uh, make you feel that, uh, that it's all nice and easy before I, before I tell you that it's not that nice and easy, I suppose, in some sense. So, so here, is, here is an abstract way of thinking about it. And now the question is, what can I do with this, with this implementation? Can I put it together within some kind of network so that, uh, so that this evaluates the function f of x faster than, uh, than, uh, than classical? Now imagine you ask me a question, I want to know every value of the function. The only thing I can say is forget about it. There is no way you can do that faster quantum mechanically than classical. If you really want every f of x, you just have to compute every f of x. That's clear. Quantum mechanics does not give you speed up. But if you want some general properties of the function, such as is it periodic, which will be important tomorrow, then you can address these things. Another feature that we saw was the one where you had some elements of the function which are different to others. That was all to do with search. And can I fi find these elements, how many of them are there, and so on. This is all called quantum search, quantum counting, and we know how to do all of these things. Um, now what I'm going to do is something, is something, um, something that you, looks a little bit unusual to show you uh, why there is a limit uh, to efficiency. But it's really a beautiful illustration of quite a few concepts that we've, uh, we've been playing with so far. Um, so let me think a little bit how to do it. Imagine this box. Again, the box, you know, we already had a, one instance of this box, which was some kind of piece of glass, uh, like a crystal, if you like, which you insert in the path of a photon and then delays the photon and gives you the, the extra phase. So that's one, one possible way of doing this. But imagine now 
uh, that I phrase it in the following way when it comes to the search. Imagine the box is really the or an oracle which has the solution inside the box. So I give you the box and the solution is hidden in there and I ask you somehow to intelligently put, query the box to get this. I mean this is really like the analog of the ancient Greek oracle. The oracle already knows who's the smartest person but the oracle is sneaky enough that it doesn't allow you to basically query it uh, directly. The oracle cannot uh, uh, answer the question who is the smartest person, but it can only answer yes, no um, kind of style of questions. And you have to ask it like that. It's the same logic here. So imagine that within this box, um, there is, there is uh, um, already a stored solution to your computation. Um, so it's a little bit like really giving you a database where there is an element which is clearly different. Um, and now I have to uncover that element. So this guy is sitting as a qubit inside the box. Um, you'll see in a second why I'm doing stuff like that. And, 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 and now you still have an input qubit up there. Um, and an output qubit, and that guy's or many qubits, and that guy is your usual X register. Okay. Um, and now this is phrased in many, in many, in many equivalent uh, ways. Uh, one way, one way is to do the following. You can say that um, uh, you can say it's exactly the analog of what we had here. You can imagine that when this guy goes through the oracle, it interacts with the right solution and it kind of senses whether this is the right solution and if the solution is uh, so if the input x matches the solution then we have one type of evolution and it really doesn't matter what type of evolution you have but if, if, if x doesn't match this i then you have some something different okay usually you think of nothing happens if x is not equal to i but, but it doesn't have to be like that so now what I'm describing is a, is a two input two output gate I'm just generalizing this, uh, and I think some of you have already <coughs> noted that, that when I presented Deutsch's algorithm, it was written in this two-qubit format in the same way. So what I'm doing now is I'm inputting uh, x and i, and what I want is a minus sign uh, if x equals i, so I want some kind of minus phase. Some people talk about a bit flip as well, and they are fully equivalent ways. So I could have an extra bit which starts at zero and flips to one if these two match each other. That would be like a control not gate, a little bit more general control not. They have exactly the same power. Uh, so they require the same amount of time to, to be implemented. And then otherwise, it's there. so this is if x equals i. And if x uh, is not equal to i, then you've got uh, basically the usual output. Okay, so that would be more or less like a generalization of, uh, of this type. But now I've quantized the box. And the question is, why does quantizing the box help me in thinking about things? And, and that's, that's really the, the interesting thing. I was, really, I was sitting at a, at a, maybe I shouldn't be making this comment, but I'm going to be as descriptive as I can. I was sitting at an ultra boring meeting some time ago, somewhere on earth. And, uh, and basically what happened is that I really was getting so bored with the talks that I started, you know, as you start thinking about other things, you start reading other papers, and even then it's still boring, and you're thinking, what am I going to do now? And then one guy got up and gave a talk that made a huge impression on me. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. I still didn't listen to him because he triggered all sorts of other ideas in my mind. So it was very good, but it was good in a positive way, not a boring way. Albinus is the name of the person. Now, uh, here is, here is and, and this is how he started to phrase these questions, and I think it's, it really makes the whole thing much clearer. I want to make a slight digression just to show you the spiritual side, why this is interesting. I think some of us have discussed these things already extensively at the questions and answers session, but I think it's worth doing it a little bit more just to show the rest of you as well. When I talked about a simple interferometer, remember the picture we've drawn already 100 times probably, is a photon going through the beam splitter and then recombined, you know, in, so any kind of interferometer. And what I said at some stage is um, uh, you, put, you put here this piece of glass which can then, so the photon comes out this way if everything is nice and matched and the parts are of equal length and so on. But if you, if you, if you don't match the faces and the parts, then basically 
um, what will happen is that the photon will be able to come out both ways depending on, on, on how you tune these differences. And I said if you insert something here, you can really make the photon come out uh, this way. Now, and this is one of those mysteries in physics, actually, that we keep coming back to, which is the following. If you put a detector there instead of a piece of glass, okay, if you have a detector, uh, which is, which is um, a standard, you know, it's called a photon multiplier, if you come from quantum optics. So a photon is absorbed. Uh, and uh, in exactly this way, basically it's based on photoelectric effect. An absorbed photon kicks an electron out into the conduction band. This electron accelerates, kicks other electrons, and basically creates an avalanche effect, which gets amplified to an electric current, and you look at it at the computer, and suddenly there is current uh, there which tells you that the photon was in this branch of, uh, of, uh, of the interferometer. And now you, you can legitimately ask, and I think lots of people are even non-specialists, this always surprises me when I speak to non-specialists, they pick this point up, and the question is immediately, what is the difference between you putting a piece of glass, which still makes this coherent, and you putting a photon multiplier here? Why does this guy click? and tell you something unless this guy doesn't do anything and still maintains the superposition, okay? So, what is the difference? I have no idea. There isn't any difference. That's the point of, of this whole thing. Each of them is a bunch of atoms, 10 to the power of 23 atoms. There couldn't be any physical difference between them. They're just designed for a different purpose. But they should really be describing exactly the same quantum mechanical effect as everything else. So that's not the direction I want to go into. Of course, this leads into all sorts of interesting debates, and at some point, and all of us have a limit to our capacity, you just get up and you say, it can't be like that, okay? And I'm going to take it to that level where you just have to get up and read and say, this can't be like that, okay? But I think it's a nice picture to think about. So why do I say that anything has collapsed here? Well. I think it's a convenient way of stopping a certain infinite chain that you would otherwise have to speak about all the time when you talk about quantum mechanics. And this is this beauty of, 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 of thinking about the world we live in. So if I really quantize this detector in the same way that I can quantize this piece of glass, so that's what I'm doing here, I'm quantizing the, the gate. I'm not just saying the gate does something for you, I'm saying here is what I, I want to give you the insides of the gate. And I want to give them as qubits, so everything is nice and quantum mechanical. So now if I do the same with the detector, um, I think it's much nicer putting a cat inside as Schrodinger did, okay? So you, you put something that's even more stunning than a bunch of electrons there. Um, then, then you say, well, if I quantize that guy, then of course the thing still remains completely in a superposition of states, okay? There can be no collapse, uh, so to speak, there. Uh, because what this guy is going to do, you know, the ultimate, what Schrodinger would say, or, or, you know, to upgrade even him, is put a human being here to look at it, right? And, and, and then you say, so what happens if I quantize the human being? And the strange thing, of course, is that, is that, is that if this is your branch zero, if you like, and if this is your branch one, and initially, at this state, before the human enters the lab, you've got a state zero, one, and, and the human is here. You see, I've quantized the human. And sure, you can argue, is this a mixed state or whatever it is. I'm going to make it pure because it's easier to calculate. If you don't like that, then extend the human to the rest of the universe as much as you like to make it pure. And at some stage, we know that this probably can be made as pure as you like. So now this human sees the photon, or it doesn't see the photon, because the photon has gone to the other direction of this. Okay, if it's taken the zero part. So this is gonna this is gonna lead. I, I I don't know how to represent it obviously, but this is going to re lead to the photon being in this branch, and let's say the human is depressed as a result because he hasn't seen the photon. This is what makes you depressed in your life. So. And uh, and and the, the the one state is is something that makes the human very happy. Okay, so I light up, I feel like having a drink after that. It's a successful experiment and so on. Okay, here is what quantum mechanics says. Has <coughs> And now you say, hey, what, what happened to the collapse? Did, you know, did he see it or not? I mean, there's only one universe. 
Well, that's where you are wrong as far as quantum mechanics is concerned. There are infinitely many universes and they're all equally legitimate in many ways. So long as you can keep the, the plus sign between these two branches, it could be that something fundamentally prevents you from doing that. So I'm going to be doing with computers exactly what I do here. I'm going to be quantizing them in this way. And, and so now you say, well, how do I ever find out anything? I mean, it's clear that there is no inconsistency. Because with respect to this guy, there is no photon in his branch. The photon is in the other side. And with respect to this guy, the photon is him. So if I was to ask the guy, do you see a definitive state? In the sense of, do you see a photon or do you not see a photon? Both of these guys would answer, yes, we see a definitive state. There is a definitive outcome, OK? There is no problem in having everything in this gigantic entangled state. And you say, no, but where is the real world? Come on, please collapse it. Okay, so let's try to collapse it. I've got a friend of this guy. This, this was Wigner's <coughs> point, and it's called Wigner's friend as a result. And the friend is really desperate to know what's going on. Hey, did Wigner see the photon or not? He opens the lab door, and he talks. So here is a friend, okay? And of course, you guessed it, I'm going to quantize the friend as well. And the friend enters, and he talks to his friend, and as you can guess, he's depressed with him, and he's trying to drown his sorrows in whiskey and gin and whatever else you like to use for that purpose. And here he's very happy. All right? There is no end to this. It's an infinite regression chain. You can never collapse anything if quantum mechanics is right. Um, you know, the, the, one of my favorite poets, actually, he's called Edgar Allan Poe. He wrote this poem, and I encourage you to read it. It's a beautiful poem in the life poetry. I don't, but I like this particular <coughs> One of the statements is the one that's very frequently repeated, and it goes like this. All we see and all we seem is but a dream within a dream. So in this interpretation, we never have reality. It's always, that's why I like to call it like that. Um, dream within a dream. So basically, there are infinitely many dreams. Of course, I'm not going to referee his poem and start uh, correcting his uh, physics. So he wasn't a physicist, he was a poet. But basically, according to this picture, you always live in another bubble. And there's never any collapse. No reality ever emerges. In each of these branches, you have a perfectly defined real world. But actually, overall, you always talk about some entangled state of this type. And quantum computers are nothing but these kind of dreams within dreams. That's really interesting. Okay, so so now why do I why do I why do I want to do something like that with my quantum computer? Okay. Um, well, why I want to do that is because I'm going to translate the efficiency of a quantum computer to how quickly it can entangle things. If I can entangle myself to the solution quickly, then you have a very fast quantum computer. If my entangling to the solution is very slow, that means I'm never going to get there. It takes me more than the age of the universe, and that's something that actually is considered very hard. So now, how do I do that is the question. And that was this interesting talk that I heard some time ago. And I think it's really a, probably the best way of, uh, of looking at this kind of stuff. Incidentally, the way you can test this is just, well, I say just, but I think you will realize it's not just, just, OK? Um, uh, it's just to try to invert this. So if you ask me, how do you know that this is the state? How do you know that it's not going to be zero, human down, friend of the human down, as a, as a matrix, you know, as a density, as a mixed state, right? How do you know that I'm not going to lose the face here, and it's going to be either half this plus half the other guy, OK? This guy here. How do you know it's not a classical mixture? You just don't know the answer, but it's really one or the other. Well, you just have to be able to reverse the whole process. So if you're a very good experimentalist, then presumably, you see, I wouldn't do this with humans because it's far too complicated and it starts to give all sorts of references to consciousness, intelligence, beauty, whatever else, and we don't care about it as far as physics is concerned. We want to subtract all of these discussions. So I would probably use some kind of computer inside that's large enough to make it uh, classical enough or microscopic enough. Uh, but with a human, so what you would have to do is you would have to, so each of these is like a generalized control knot. 
C naught here leads to a state like this, and another C naught between the H and the friend, human and the friend, leads to a state like that. C naught is a fully invertible gate, and basically, if you reverse this kind of state, you can perfectly reversibly go into the state like that, if quantum mechanics is correct. If something happened in the meantime, where one of the alternatives became real, really, it's really this, not that, then you're never going to get back this state. Okay? If you, if you start from this state and reverse it, you're going to go into a mixture of these states. Okay? It's going to be something like that that you get back. Not what you started with. It's not going to pass the same test as your original one. So you can test really whether the world is like that. All you need to know is the Hamiltonian of my brain when I'm observing a cat that's being poisoned by a poison which came out of a brain. Of course, it's, it is a little bit funny, I agree with you. Uh, but I think that you know you can test it because you want it somewhere. <coughs> now, how do I do that with computers? Um, what I'm going to imagine now is that this guy here is not just one database element. So, like I said, you can ask for more general properties, but let look, let's look at database elements because it makes it easier. We know what we're doing. What I'm going to ask them: if I can, if I can have one database element as a quantum, as a quantum. Um, state here, you can immediately ask, why not search over all possible databases? Okay, it's so like one of those Borges books with all the possible books in the library, an infinite library, and now you're looking for one book inside, okay? So here are all the books superposed together, and I'm searching for all of them simultaneously. And in every universe, I'm going to find a different book that I want. It's great, you know? So this is really nice. I'm happy in every universe. So what I... What I have inside is this guy instead of this guy. Okay? So I'm going to switch to here so you can see what I'm doing. So what I'm, in, what I'm going to input is x, and I'm going to input all possible databases. I don't know really how many of them there are, but let's say this goes from 1 to some n there. It doesn't make any difference, whatever the size is. And I'm going to search over all of them. And if I have a successful algorithm, then in each world I must be correlated to a different database that I'm looking for simultaneously. And that's the power of quantum computers. If you show me that a quantum computer can solve one of the inputs of your problems, then it can solve all of the inputs. I mean, that's how it's designed. Coherence is the key in quantum mechanics. You solve them all in one problem. That's great. And now what am I going to do? Well, of course, what I'm going to do is put all the x's in a superposition. Why not exploit it completely? Which is what we did last time anyway. So I exploit it to the extent that x's are also fully in a super. I need as many x's as i's, obviously, because I want in each world to get the right solution. Here is an input to my fully quantum mechanical uh, fictitious computer at some, uh, in some sense. And now what I want to do is I want to start applying that gate. And the gate, and the gate does this kind of stuff. So what I want to compute is how quickly do the two registers, if you like now, get entangled. The final state that I want, and I don't know how many steps it will take me. I want to calculate the number of steps as a function of this n guy. The final state is a fully entangled um, state where this guy is always the same as that guy, okay? So it's something like, if you like, um, in the simplest notation, i, i, okay? So each axis, I've eliminated all axes other than the ones that correspond to that, to that guy. Okay, and the question now is how quickly can I do it? How do I do that? I calculate how much the two get entangled after one application of the oracle. What is the best that this guy can do in a single step? And then I tell you how many times I have to do this to reach this kind of state. Okay? So it's exactly going to be like this. I've got 100 units of entanglement between this and this. I'll tell you how well we are going to quantify what's the most convenient. So here I have no entanglement, as we know. Here I have lots of entanglement. Okay. Now, let's say I have 100 units of entanglement. I apply the gate, and I generate one unit of entanglement. 
you've got the efficiency immediately, you've got to do it 100 times to get 100 units of entanglement. And that's going to be this kind of logic. It's very simple. So the power of the computer in single instance, in a single application, is how many units of entanglement can I generate? How am I going to do that? The way I'm going to do that is, is the following. I'm going to trace out the computer. Let's call this your computer, and let's call this your, your oracle, if you like. So this is this oracle. And this is your input state, uh, but I'm going to call it computer. So you trace out the computer, and you look at the state of the oracle. I mean, you know these things. It's a repetition. Now, how do I quantify entanglement? Um, and, and this state is, of course, independent of this guy. So when you trace it, you still get this state. And if you write this state as a density matrix, it's going to look something like that. Sum over i, sum over j. Uh, you notice that I didn't normalize it with 1 over root n and so on, the usual story as, as, as before. Um, i, j, that's it. Okay? So each of these i, j's go to one, from 1 to n. Okay? If you look at this state of the computer, it's an n by n matrix like that. And basically, the entries are everywhere the same. It's got ones or 1 over root n, if you do it properly, everywhere. Diagonal of diagonal. So here is like that. Okay. Everywhere are ones. The same, the same guy. Everywhere the same. Okay? What happens in the final state? So now let's fast forward to the final state. So this is your input, if you like. And I do the same. I, I, I chase out, I chase out the, the so this is your computer, this is your oracle, if you like. I chase out the computer, but now they are maximally entangled. And what I get is something that's maximally mixed on the other side. So if you look at, if you look at the output state, it's going to look like that, i, i. Okay? There will be only one summation. I've only got the diagonal elements. There are no all diagonals. The coherence, right? Because my, my oracle is now entangled completely to my computer. The final state of the computer looks like that. One's on the diagonal, and zero's everywhere else. All right? So entangling of two systems like this, you can think of as, as creation of entanglement between two of them. We all know that. That's the basis of, of the measurement I was describing there. How Schrodinger gets entangled to the cat, who gets entangled to the cat. Okay. So now, how quickly can I delete the off diagonal elements? It's the same question as how quickly I can entangle. And all I want to know now is how many off diagonal elements do I change when I put a minus sign in the right way as I'm gonna do as I'm gonna do with this guy here. Okay, that's the that's the question here. So the easiest way of seeing this is as follows. Um, um, again it's really just a five uh, line proof and it's not very difficult. Um, here is what you would do. Um, so so what I really want is is a quantity that's something like the sum of all the off-diagonal elements. And initially, this is equal to, you have to sum up all of these guys basically that are not on the diagonal. Okay? So you've got something like n squared elements, and the diagonal has n elements, and that's roughly the number. Now, since we only care about the, the, the overall efficiency of this, n is much smaller than n squared, and, and as usual as physicists, we can ignore these things. So I'm going to say that they are roughly um, n squared of the, okay, so here, here is what it is, right? like that, n squared of the diagonal elements. Um, finally, there is zero of the diagonal. The sum of these guys uh, in the final state of the diagonal uh, is basically output is zero. Okay. Now I have to see how quickly I can scale that. How do I do that? One application. Now notice what I'm. Let me sp spell out this state for you to see what the what one application does. The initial state is something like one, and I'm going to write the other register deliberately in in this uh, extended fashion. Okay. The next state is two, but it's coupled initially to the same state one plus two plus three and so on. Okay. 
And then, so I just basically expanded the first register rather than writing it as a, as a, as a, as a sum like that. So then n is the final one, 1 plus 2 and so on, plus n. So in this way, um, I can clearly see what's going to happen for each of these axes. This element is the one that's going to get a minus sign from my oracle, 1, 1. It is a minus sign. Nothing else gets a minus sign. In this case, the two guy, the, the, the number two guy gets a minus sign. Nothing else is changed. And in the final case, the number n gets a minus sign and nothing changes. Does this state, is this a state with a decreased number of, of diagonal elements, the decreased sum? Yes. How do I know that? Because this state is not orthogonal to this state. It's not orthogonal to this state and so on. They're no longer really, so it's not the same state, but it's not completely orthogonal as at the end of this. It's somewhere in between. And that means that I've reduced somehow this uh, uh, overlap, if you like, or the sum of the orthogonals from n squared towards zero. Okay? And if you really sum them up, all of these guys properly, and you say, how many places did I really reduce this? So now you trace out, trace out the computer. You write down the density matrix of your of your uh, of your oracle. It's um, you can do it the other way around. It's always the same for this. It's fully symmetric. And basically, you sum up the, the diagonal elements in the same the off diagonal in the same way. And what's interesting if you do that is that you can show that uh, that the difference between so if you look at the difference between the off diagonals now uh, between i step and i plus one in general which means that I'm at some stage, I application of the oracle and I do the next one, what you will get is that this goes roughly as n root n. Okay. So you cannot reduce the off diagonals in a single shot by more than n times root n. And and this is actually a very simple thing to prove in a very similar way that, that, uh, that we proved uh, uh, witnessing entanglement in general, uh, but the conclusion is, is interesting, and the conclusion is that I have to do this uh, number of times root n to get up to there. So I have to go from here to here, but a unit step has only this much power to <coughs> entangle. And because I have to entangle uh, with n squared units, I really need square root n step to do that. And, and that's a formal proof that no uh, type of search can do better than, uh, than Grover's search. Okay. And you can now go into it and you can say, what if I want to count? What if I want to know how many of the good guys are here? Then you can really invent a new oracle where you have five of these guys, they all entangle and so on, and you can get a limit for that. You can modify the functional properties as well for this, and then you can put a the most stringent bound on a quantum computer in general. And the bound, like I said, is a polynomial bound. If you really want some general properties, you cannot do better than, than this. Um, OK, now, um, what, I, what I want to say is that even though, as a physicist, what I repeated last time, even though it looks like, a, like only a polynomial bound and we're not very excited about it, then in practice, of course, there is a big difference to one million qubits in your computer or 1,000 qubits in your computer. And this is something that I'd like to address next, because this depends on, on how you implement these guys and what are the difficulties when you try to implement them. I and you will see that different difficulties pop up if you do different kind of implementations. But we always face some fundamental problems of some, of some nature. So what I want to really continue with is talk a little bit about, uh, about implementations of quantum computation. And then I will really uh, I will really continue in the way that I will try to describe error correcting uh, protocols towards the end of the course so that you can see that even though we have errors all the time, we know how to deal with them. So what I intend to do is I intend to do uh, three implementations, uh, which, which are very different and you can get the, the global picture by, by thinking about them. One is just photonic implementation, I think lots of you here know about it. The other one is really um, the other one is NMR. So that's more like a solid state implementation with spins, and you can see how these guys operate. It's very different 
it's a very different type of physics from the first one. Um, and, and then the final one is, is ion traps. Again, it's somewhere in between in some sense. Um, lots of people are betting that ion traps are possibly the best direction to go. That's why I'm talking in this order, because I'd like to talk about the first two and I'd like to shoot them down at some level. It's maybe not so good. And then I'll tell you how these difficulties are addressed within ion traps, but of course ion traps have, have a lot of other difficulties on their own. So I think it's best probably to make a to make a ten minute break. And we continue with this when we when we come in. Okay. 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 Okay, and uh, the second probably uh, more important announcement is that just to remember, those of you who are not from here, just remember to send your, all your expenses to Marcelo, if you can give me the expenses, and remember to put down the name of your graduate course, uh, which you're attending, so he knows, and name and address, so he knows where to send all the details of the course in case you need them. I think he will send you this lovely DVD that will be produced, so you can watch it over and over again when you get a moment of right. Okay, implementations of QC. I'm choosing three, three implementations simply because they look very different from one another, and they, I think they will suffer from different, uh, different problems, which is why I'd like to address them. The first one is really photonics, and somehow we can do we can do lots of stuff with uh, with photons because we have a good control of certain um, we have good, good control of certain features like what I said, creating a superposition of different states. This is really one of the key elements, and if you can go from zero to zero plus one, then you got half of these things right. The rest is really letting the functional evaluation take place and then you have to be able to in invert the superposition that you made uh, but that's presumably as difficult as making it in the first place so it's very tempting to say once these two are easy then maybe I've got, uh, I've got some, kind of, uh, some kind of a computer and certainly photonics, in photo just phot photonics is really means photons I'm not using atoms, I could combine them and then of course it gets a little bit more interesting and so on so basically, um, um, what, is the, what is the main issue here? One difficulty that I, that I mentioned was simply preparing single photons. Okay, this is a practical difficulty. People are getting better and better at it, and I think sooner or later, and rather probably sooner than later, and by sooner I mean within five years, you'll probably have some kind of a source that will uh, emit a photon when you press a button there. You press a button, a photon comes out, and you know. So that's, that's good to have for this kind of stuff. At the moment, people do all sorts of things. For example, I mentioned generating a, a pair of entangled photons, getting a click from one of the one of these uh, twins in the pair, and then knowing that the other twin then exists and proceeding with that. But of course, this is hugely inefficient. You wouldn't like to be doing something like that all the time. So preparing a photon may not be the easiest thing, but of course, once you have it, the superposition is just done by a beam split, and that's really very, very easy, and it works efficiently. So you have Hadamard gate, if you like, uh, the one that takes you from 0 into 0 plus 1, is simply a beam split. Uh, and that's all nice and, nice and easy. Uh, the difficulty, I think I mentioned this before with an analogy with Star Wars, I suppose, movies, is, is really that you cannot interrupt photons very easily. And that's, that's, that's what kills this ultimately in some sense. And of course there are proposals to rescue this and so on. Uh, but, but ultimately, it's very difficult to do these things. Um, so, so what do I have in mind? What I have in mind is that if you have uh, one photon and you want to create, uh, you, want to, you want to interact it with another photon, then somehow it's not, it's not exactly clear how to achieve a control not gate from these guys. So for example, imagine you want to go into a state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Um, uh, that, that, that I think is, is, is difficult depending on your implementation. Uh, and I'll show you some of the difficult. I don't have the time really to go through all of them, and I think some of you already know probably more about these things than I do. There are two issues here. One is, first of all, how do I encode these things? And the choice there is between internal and external degrees of freedom, if you like. So one way, here I spoke, here I spoke about the location of the photon 
which would be like an external degree of freedom. But you can think of these guys as your polarization of the photon. So you're never, you're never creating or destroying a photon. You really have all the end photons, and now you only change their internal state. This is something that people do most of the time because that's the easy one. If you ask yourself, what if I, what if I would like zero to present, to present an absence of a photon? and one a presence of a photon. And I get from no photons into a superposition of zero plus one proton in one location. The answer is you can, but it's much more difficult. It probably engages some kind of atom that you have on the side, three level atom, one extra quantized degree of freedom, one classical driving field, and it's a mess. Okay? Uh, it has certain other advantages, but I think at this level you wouldn't be doing something like that. So the best choice as far as as far as uh, people are, are concerned, is really to use always the presence of photons. Um, so don't use that degree of freedom, but use either their location or use their, their polarization uh, to encode qubits. And of course, you can combine both of them to get, much, to get as much memory as possible. Now, now, at this stage, in order for, to show you how you would start to... Uh, so again, when it comes to polarization, you can easily rotate horizontal into 45 degrees, and that's your superposition of states. So the, this, this guy here would simply say start with horizontal polarization and then go into H plus B. This can be done deterministically, as deterministically as anything can be done in this universe. So this is the, this is the easy part. The hard part again, and this was an issue when they were trying to implement things like teleportation protocol. Um, the hard part is to get these guys to communicate with each other. So, so if you, for example, if you start from HH, two photons, and you want them to go into HH plus BB, would be the analog, then I think it's not something that's entirely obvious how to do within within optical regime. How would I achieve this kind of uh, transformation? So this is the analog of the 45 degrees rotation for two uh, quantum bits. Um, so at this stage I have to engage, uh, uh, some time ago I told you the quantum mechanics has four postulates and I was making fun of uh, all the other books that uh, didn't say that it was four but it was five or seven or ten or eleven or whatever else you read there. But of course it has really five postulates and the fifth postulate is the one to do with indistinguishability of particles and I think that's what this guy is going to try to cash in on. The fact that particles are not fully uh, fully distinguishable uh, in quantum mechanics in general. So how, how does that work? Um, I think this is a nice lesson because once we go through this, you will see this occurring in other implementations. So NMR is going is to exploit a similar effect but for fermions, not for bosons. So uh, what I'm going to try to do is, is come up with an analog uh, of what I said was the key thing that you should be able to achieve. And this is this kind of transformation. In terms of qubits, it's really a Hadamard rotation and then a control knot on the second one. And if you can do these things, if you can create an entangled state out of a disentangled state, then you have the basic unit. And now you keep repeating it, and any computation can be made efficiently. So this gate is really the crucial gate. It doesn't matter whether you can address single qubits, you have to be able to do something like that. Um, and the immediate idea in optics is, is again to say, why not big splitters? Why not put two photons through a big splitter and try to exploit that? And that's an interesting game, actually. And, and this game is the, by far the best way about learning um, uh, about particle statistics, if you like, than anything else that, that I know in undergraduate physics. And no one ever tells you about this, which is interesting as well. So basically, usually you go into this entropy, and then you maximize entropy, and then you argue uh, that you have some boxes and then you permute the boxes and you're putting things in boxes and getting out of the boxes and you get some three different distributions and Bob's your uncle, okay? So that's, that's roughly the derivation. And, and you come out of the lecture not understanding probably anything. Um, particle statistics already works at the level of two particles, okay? Of course, one particle doesn't have anything to, to work with, but with two you already get all the features. And anything that, that takes place with million particles is just a consequence of doing the same thing that you do on two particles. And this really what I will describe is something that Mandel did uh, maybe some 20 years ago. So surprisingly, he didn't do it 80 years ago, which is when quantum mechanics came up. He only did it 20 years ago. It's a basic test of the indistinguishability. So as we know, 
particles in, in quantum mechanics, identical particles, are really genuinely indistinguishable. Not to the extent that we humans cannot distinguish them, to the extent that even God cannot distinguish identical particles with all the infinite uh, wisdom of his. Okay, they really ultimately are the same. And as you know, there are two kinds of uh, indistinguishable particles, and these guys are bosonic particles, and they like to bunch, but I'll show you how that works, really. And then, so they are always, they are the friendliest particles, they love to be together, a little bit like partying and uh, the atmosphere here, I suppose everyone is together all the time. And then you've got the fermionic particles, which always do the opposite of each other. This was like uh, the marriage of my grandparents, which was extremely successful precisely because they never went to the same place together. Um, so these guys, one went to you know, one friend's house, the other one would go elsewhere, and they really lived happily ever after. Uh, these are, this is fermionic behavior. Now, how do I look at that at, at the level of two, pa uh, of two particles? What, what Mandel did is the following. A ridiculously simple idea in some sense. It's so simple that uh, an optician now, when they enter their lab, they do this kind of test to calibrate this. They don't do it as a test of quantum mechanics, they do it just to see whether the apparatus works. It's, it's very basic. So what Mandel did is he said, um, let, me, let me do the following, let me put one photon here. So it's always one photon in each of these branches. So that's going to try to do this, but it's going to fail, and that's going to be the problem. Um, so he said, let me, of course Mandel didn't have this in mind, he really wanted to test who knows these particles, what do I know about them, what is it the knowledge that matters and which knowledge doesn't matter. So he was really testing the fundamental quantum mechanics. <laughs> so he said, I'm going to put them one, uh, one in this branch and one in this branch. And then again, you know, there is some output here. Probably what I should do is really be pedantic now and label this as the input one, as we have been doing before, input two, output 3 and output 4. Again, a standard quantum optics picture of things. And now I'm going to ask, how do they come out? Depending on how I prepare them at the input, how do they come out? Which way do they come out? 3 or 4? And the usual way of doing, the usual way of doing uh, quantum mechanics, uh, especially when you're an undergraduate, is, is really the wrong way of doing it. It gives you something right, but it's not really how you should do things. Is to say the following. I've got this photon here. And, and we, we did the calculation basically before. We can even bunch it together. So one photon enters here, another photon enters here. And again, because of linearity of quantum mechanics, I can separately say this guy does this and this guy does that. So one, as we already know, goes into three plus four, but there is this i if you want to take all of these guys into account, plus four. Um, and two, goes also into 3 plus 4, but basically the guy 4 gets, uh, gets the phase, I4. Uh, and what do I say now? Well, I expand these guys and I get I3, 3 plus, you know, I, well, minus if you like, minus 3, 4, plus 4, 3, and plus I4, 4. I just expanded the full state. And now you say, well, uh, what I'm going to do is, is uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to punish myself for being a naughty boy and ignoring the fact that uh, that these guys are really indistinguishable from one another. And how do I punish myself in quantum mechanics? I don't have a whip, which is the usual form of punishment in some societies. What I do is I basically symmetrize the wave function. You know, that's that's. It's, it's really a voodoo principle. It makes no sense in the language that I'm using. But if you use field theory, second quantization, it's already encoded there. You cannot not do it, okay? But this is why I'm punishing myself because I'm speaking at a low level of physics. So if I anti-symmetrize them, if I claim that I cannot discriminate a photon coming out this way from a photon coming out this way, then this state has got to be the same as that state, which means they go out, they cancel each other out. And what this prediction says is that I've got a half probability, well, half if you normalize this properly, which I did, right? So you've got half probability for each of these outcomes, okay? You've got half probability for 3, 3, and half for 4, 4, okay? And that's called bunching. Okay, so symmetrization explains the bunch. They either go this way or that way. They go both ways simultaneously, as we know. But if I detect them, I will get this kind 
for that guy. Okay. And now Mandel said, okay, what if I really try to play with them? And I test, uh, I test the indistinguishability with respect to uh, which indistinguishability should I really not be able to tell them apart. And he said, I'm going to actually call one of these photons Alice and the other one Bob. I'm going to discriminate them. Here is the Alice photon, here is the Bob photon. How do I do that? I prepare this guy in the horizontal state of polarization. And I prepare this guy in the vertical state of polarization. Here is Alice, Mr. Horizontal. And here is, uh, here is uh, uh, Bob, if you like, Mr. Vertical. Okay? And we know that. Um, what, what, what happens at the end of this uh, experiment? What happens, of course, is that now you know these guys, you can add this extra degree here, and I can no longer cancel them out. Because this guy, 3, 4, is going to come out something like HB, and the other guy is going to come out as BH, and I'm going to know that Alice comes out one way, and Bob comes out the other way, and I just wait with a detector, and I say, hello, Alice, thank you for coming this way. So it's all of the four possibilities that are present there. Right? They come out equally like. And now comes the intelligent bit. Okay? What Mandel says is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them fly for a long time. It's like the delayed choice experiment. And I'm going to let them be Alice and Bob all the way just before the beam splitter. And then I'm going to screw it up, just for my own pleasure. So just before this guy arrives here, Mandel introduces something that rotates the guy from H to B and makes it identical to the other guy. Okay? So initially, I know who is who. God knows who is who. Everyone knows which of the photons is which. But one microsecond before the beam splitter, I make them the same. What's going to happen now? Exactly the same as the first experiment. Only two possibilities come, come out. And this is how we know that even God doesn't know which photon is which. Because if God knew it, what we'll be able to see through these uh, jokes that we're making there and basically still maintain the same logic. So they really are this dimension. And now you can play zillion games with this of labeling photons. You can label them not just with H and B, but with momentum, position, whatever else you like to have. And you can play the same game of the distinguishability. And now you can already see what's interesting there. If I don't do use this H and B, if, if I basically, if I don't do this, I really get, if they are the same, or if I don't use this degree, then you've got the situation where two photons go one way, or two photons go the other way, okay? So this gives me one bit of information. I could use another degree of freedom, which is the coincidence counts, where one goes one way and the other one goes the other way. But this is three different states. I need four different states, and that's the killer. I can't get four different states with something like a beam spread uh, or anything that's known as linear optics. So ideally, you will remember that I, that I was transforming these guys into four Bell states. I wanted to create all entangled states, states that I could create. Okay, BH goes into minus sign and, and BB goes into something like uh, HH minus BB. Okay, so I want to rotate the whole basis into an entangled basis. Here, I can only get three outcomes out of four. I can't discriminate the fourth one from one of the three ones, and that's actually the bad thing. So I can, so to put it more dramatically, even if everything else in the teleportation experiment worked perfectly well, I still would not volunteer because there is still only three quarters chance of being successful with each qubit, and I've got too many qubits in my body to play these kind of odds. So even under perfect circumstances, there is one quarter chance that you won't be able to tell what's happening. And that's the problem with that. So in other words, what this really means translated into quantum computation is that you can never make a control knot out of a thing like that. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, unfortunately, that means that I need some kind of nonlinear element there. I need something that's going to count the number of photons. That's roughly what it means, nonlinear. I need something that's going to do a different thing for one photon, for two photons, and so on. And these things exist, but they're very difficult. One of the nonlinearities is the down conversion itself. So I fire one squillion <coughs> photons. And out of that, I only get one entangled pair. It's super inefficient because it's a process of the second order. It's very unlikely to happen. 
and this is the difficulty with any nonlinearity. So what people have been proposing, for example, is to add a nonlinearity in the form of measurement and say, try to do a control mode gate like this. If you fail, try to do it again and repeat it until you have a control knot. And then you have the control knot that you can use as your basic gate. And actually, uh, there are some very intelligent proposals there that have amplified this to quite, quite high probability, but they're all very intricate. It's a little bit like error correction. You make a measurement, you get an undesired outcome. It means you have to repeat it many times to get, uh, to get what you want. So that really is the major, is the major problem in this kind of optical, optical implementations. Of course, the other problems, even if you ignore this control knot and you say, I can somehow deal with that, the second problem is that it's very difficult to make, and this may be an even more general problem from the industrial point of view, is that it's very difficult to make these guys small. Um, you, you can't do what you do in solid state physics and, and, and make something super small that does exactly the same for you, some basic gate, some chip. It's very difficult to put an optical table onto a small chip and play the same game there. It's just inefficient to work with light. So light is fast, information travels faster than anything with, with material objects, but somehow it's very, it's very difficult to confine it to a small space and control it in this, in this coherent way. So that would be even the ultimate, the ultimate problem even if you manage to solve, uh, to solve the control model. Uh, now the sec so the, the second the second one of course people have done all sorts of all sorts of implementations we've had teleportation we've had dense coding with this guy we had this uh, what I call the interaction pre measurement you know detecting the bomb without exploding it we had grower search algorithm we had within cluster states quantum computation with four qubits with six qubits now even eight qubits I think people can do eight photons at a time. But so people do all sorts of things, but each of these ultimately suffers from this kind of inefficiency. So when they tell you that they that they that they implemented some kind of complicated algorithm, they don't even tell you that there is this inefficiency. They only look at the outcomes that they like. It's seriously post-selected. If they really gave you the real probability of doing the experiment, it would be 10 to minus 23, okay, or even worse than that with the full generation, which is unlikely, subsequent measurements, which could fail, and so on, it's exponentially unlikely that they would do anything coherent in, in this kind of setting. OK, then people said, why don't we get a little bit more creative? Why don't we use something that doesn't have these problems and where, where interaction is by default given to you for free? So these guys don't interact. But let's go into another domain, and I think I mentioned it before. And in fact, these guys interact all the time. You cannot switch them off. That's how bad they are. So that's, of course, immediately a problem as well, because now can I control? Can I actually switch them off and, and tell them to stop doing what they're doing? Because I need to measure them and I need to extract some results out of them. See, you see how, how uh, trouble is always conserved uh, in some way um, as, we, as we cross uh, to a different inter implementation. Now, the advantage of this is another advantage. The advantage is that even I can do experiments with NMR, believe it or not. In fact, I have done it. I'm not making a conjectural statement that I'm able to do it. I really have done it. And, and it's really do, like doing computational physics, OK? You email some guy with a, with a description of the molecule that, that you would like them to synthesize. Six months down the line, a package arrives in your, in your mailbox. You open it. And it's basically a molecule there inside a test tube. Okay, it's all nice and microscopic. So it's, it's a sample, it's liquid, it's at room temperature. You don't have to cool it down and do things like that. So there's nothing that's, that's difficult there. Then I go inside the room, I make sure I don't have any pacemakers, nothing metallic with me, and so on, because there is a huge magnet there with a huge gradient. That I think if you're not careful and you have your watch, all sorts of things can happen as you approach. The magnet. Okay, so you're warned in advance, the magnet is huge, you climb up the stairs, you insert the bottle in the magnet, and this is all it takes. This is the this is the know-how as far as experiments are concerned. So that's why I said even I can do it. I mean sometimes you spill a little bit if you're not careful, but I think that's the only error that you have there. What happens then is that this is so advanced, this technique, because a guy called Rabi worked very hard in 1930s and 40s. Columbia University to basically integrate it so that 
so that even an idiot can, can run experiments. All you need to do is go to a computer and tell the computer, I want the following gates to be done to my sample. First do a Hadamard, literally, you write the computer code. First do a Hadamard, then a control node, then another Hadamard. You write it like that. That's why it's the same as theoretical simulation. You press return, okay? The computer runs the pulses for you. It's all nice and integrated. You have to align beam splitters and things like that. I'm just telling you how easy. That's why lots of people jumped up and said, that's going to be our quantum computer, okay? Because it's so easy. You don't have to pull it down. You don't have to do anything. And now this pulses somehow, so you've got some, some kind of um, magnetic field that's applied to these things that makes them precess, and you can do all sorts of gates like that. Um, so dream come true, or easy. Okay, so that's the, that's the point. Um, one of the problems, and possibly the major problem of this, so everything else is nice, other than the fact that this is what people call um, somehow an ensemble uh, experiment. In the sense that while there I really work with single protons, and I know when I have protons, there I have no idea what the qubits are that I'm talking about, because they are all in a hugely mixed state. So I've got something like 10 to the power of 23 nuclei. And each of these nuclei is my qubit. But actually, they come in these molecules. And you design your molecules so that you'd like, to, you'd like to engineer the gate that this can do. So let's say you have some kind of molecule with two hydrogen uh, atoms. And you choose these guys. And basically, you say that one of the nuclei, the left one is going to be qubit 1. The right one is going to be qubit 2. And, and what I want to be able to now do is make some kind of gates, flip this spin, and do some kind of control knot. The problem is that each of these 10 to 23 molecules is doing exactly the same computation. You can't discriminate one molecule from another. They're giving you a collective signal out. So you already see a problem. If I do a computer, uh, a computer search algorithm here, and I go to some guy and I say, look, I've done it 1,000 times faster than you can, the guy will say, please give me 10 to the power of 23 classical computers, and I will do the same, even better than you. Okay? So you is an unfair comparison. Okay? We have too many computers here. But they are really easy to make, so there's no problem. That's it. So now, why are they always coupled to each other? They are coupled to each other because of the particle statistics, but now it's for me only. These are spin halves. So basically, they like to exclude each other. And we already explained that they don't like to be in the same state as one another, which means that you know, if, if, if they're in a state like that, that state tends to go into a state like that, simply because what you like is some kind of symmetrized state of these guys, or anti-symmetric. But you have to go into something like some gate like that. So exchange interaction is always given to you for free within a molecule. That's how these molecules are, are put together. That, that's run in the background non-stop. So in some sense, a control knot is a free gate within this quantum computer. It doesn't take any, uh, any effort to make it. it. One small problem now, and you see, that's why I'm contrasting these guys. One small problem is how do I do an individual qubit gate, now you say. OK, I've got a control lot, no problem. But how do I basically get, how do I know that when I apply a pulse, I'm really rotating this guy, and I'm not ro rotating this guy? The only way to do that is really to make one of these atoms see a different environment from this guy. So if the molecule is not completely symmetric and this guy has got some carbon atoms next to it, the other guy has got some nitrogen atom next to it, then there will be a small shift in their, in their transition frequencies. And that means that if you are able to tune your driving frequency to exactly one of them rather than the other, then you can flip one of them and not the other. But this is within one molecule, again, I repeat. That means I can flip this guy but simultaneously, in all 10 to the 23 atoms, I flip this guy, not this guy. Okay, so that's what I can do. Um, so is this good enough? What can I, what can I get out? Um, and the trouble is that the trouble is the following: uh, you cannot get much out of it for the following reason. Um, so Hadamard's control knots are dead easy to do if this is what you have in mind. They are really almost for free in NMR. Um, 
your spins frequently, nuclear spins, also have a long coherence time. So frequently you don't even have to worry too much about errors that take place uh, during your computation. So you can think of something like uh, maybe a couple of seconds or more that these guys can preserve a coherent state. If you put them in a superposition of up and down, they stay like that for two seconds. And that's really a long amount of time. You can, you can uh, uh, do lots of gates during that time. Um, but now, what's the problem? The problem is that they are really at room temperature. And, and, and the frequency, usually, usually the splitting frequency of up and down, if you talk about one spin up and another spin, spin down, the splitting frequency is roughly uh, megahertz, okay? Something like 10 to 6 hertz. That's the rate of precession, if you like. Um, and, um, and, and you say, okay, that's all nice and, nice and good. So what's the state of my sample, if you like? I've got this sample, I inserted it there, and I'm about to do gates. And, and now you say, what's the state of my sample here? And the state of your sample, of course, is that each spin will be in a state up or down with the Boltzmann probability attached to it. So imagine, imagine that really this state has zero energy, just to make it simple. Then the, then the top energy here is, is uh, h bar omega, okay? And, and this is something roughly uh, 10 to minus 34 times uh, 10 to 6, okay? So it's, uh, it's, basically, it's, basically, uh, um, it's basically a number that I would like to now compare to kT because that's my energy due to temperature and I'd like to see, and I'd like to see how how these guys compare to each other. So this is something like 10 to minus 28, okay? And, um, and, and of course you will see that at room temperature, um, uh, you get something that's not so, uh, not so favorable. So KT is something like 23, if I remember, and then you have 300, which is, let's say it's 1,000 degrees. It's not really 1,000, it's 300, but it's good enough. So this is something like 10 to 20. Uh, 10 to minus uh, 20, okay? And it's the ratio of these two temperatures, of these two energy scales, that I have to look at when I'm looking at, uh, at the populations in the zero state and then the one state, okay? So my state is zero with some probability. It's a mixed state, and that's the problem. And one with another probability. And this guy really is just, so let's imagine that, that this energy is zero, so the, the, you know, this is one in, in some sense. This P1 would then be e to the minus h bar omega over kT divided by the partition function, which is in this case something like that. Okay. And what you will discover, very unfortunately, is that these guys are very close to one another. So the probability for zero is almost a half and equal to the probability for one. Simply because, because these guys are, are, very, are very small numbers. Uh, and, and so you can never guarantee that you, have, uh, that you have a good fraction of a pure state. So this is for one spin. This I have to multiply 10 to the power of 23. And that's your NMR sample, if you like, all 10 to the power of 23 spins. If I'm talking about two spins, then I really need the same state for the other spin, P0, 0 plus P1, 1, and all of this 10 to the power of 23 times. And now it's a problem because neither of the, these guys are very close to being maximally mixed. And if I didn't, imagine that they were really maximally mixed at really high temperature then basically what I would have is identity over 2 for one spin times identity over 2 for the other spin. And if I did any unitary computation of this, I would always get identity out. I would always get no signal out of, out of my NMR sample when I try to extract any measurement. So it's not good to be very close to identity. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, it's even worse than that. And, and, and it, can be, it can be explained in the following way. You're so close, so your state Usually you would write the state of, of your system as e to the minus, um, okay, Hamiltonian divided by kT and then divided by the partition uh, function. This is your usual Boltzmann state. It's a compressed way of writing something like that. But basically because you have a very high temperature here, this number is very small 
okay? This number is 10 to minus 28 divided by 10 to 20, okay? Which is something like 10 to 8, the ratio of these guys. 10 to minus 8. It's a very small number. Almost zero. And if it was zero, then you would have 50-50 here. So you are only almost a one billionth, only a billionth away, if you like, from a maximum mean state for each qubit. So it's very difficult to be now precise to tell whether you really are in some pure state or not. And I think that's the difficulty with, with NMR. And it really amplifies, it becomes worse and worse exponentially when I raise it to a certain number of, of these. So if I want to have, instead of two, two qubits here, if I want to have 10, I'll be raising something like this to the power of 10. And then my, my spectroscopy is no longer even able to discriminate between different pure outcomes. You can't do that. In fact, 15 is the current world record with NMR. But no one thinks that you can go beyond 20 because of your precision of your, of your output measurements. So this state, if you like, is identity minus H over KT for all parts. The higher all the terms are completely irrelevant. This is small. This is this is a billionth of, of the of the of the value. And and so in some sense you get lots of things for free here. These qubits couple each other. Okay. And couple to each other for free, you can rotate them for free and so on. But the final stage of extracting the output becomes extremely, extremely difficult because of the mixedness of the state. And that's why some people believe that this is not going to be a quantum computer. In fact, and this is a really nice exercise for you, that I'm, I'll leave it up to you because I think it's, uh, it's not all that interesting to go through it in detail. If you start from a state like this, and you apply a Hadamard to control knot. So if I started from a state 0, 0, and I apply the Hadamard and control knot, I would get the state 0, 0 plus 1, 1, maximally entangled. But now I'm starting from all possible four states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Each has a, almost the same probability. And if you ask yourself, what do I get at the output, you can actually prove conclusively that you never get entangled an entangled state. So if you take the output now, if you take this NMR state rho, and you do the control knot and, uh, and, uh, and Hadamard, what comes out is something that has a positive partial transposition. We can prove it. We can transpose and see that it's entangled. And that really kills you. And in fact, in the early days when we were doing NMR quantum computers, there was even lots of criticism of that type. The criticism just said you can't even make an entangled state your system. How can you call that a quantum computer? Now there is of course a debate whether entanglement is even necessary and I think some of you know about this debate. So it's not a clear cut, but I would say it's very bad that that, that even this simple entangling gate in some sense does not, uh, does not do the job. So again, you gain lots of things with respect to optics, but I think you also lose lots of things with respect to, with respect to um, optics. Um, and now what I want to mention, probably just very briefly because we won't have that much time, is really the linear ion traps. When you, when you mention this problem to NMR people, then the first thing that will come to their mind is to ask you why you're doing liquid state NMR. Why room temperature? Why not solid state NMR? Why don't you pull your NMR sample to some kind of low value and in fact, this is one direction that people have taken. And they already have a fully entangled pair for a certain amount of time at low enough temperature. But cooling costs a lot of money. And if you really have to go to millikelvin or microkelvin, then I think you're really doing too much already. Uh, and, and all the advantages of NMR have been gone. You might as well do something else, which is the, uh, the ion traps. Because you can control ions much better than you can control control nuclear at this stage. Um, one interesting thing is to ask really how many pure qubits can I get out of a guy like that by some kind of cooling. Okay? You can do a process that's really beautiful, it's called algorithmic cooling, which is exactly what a Maxwell's demon would do if it saw a mess like this. So you know, you enter a room and you have molecules moving everywhere and you say, what am I going to do now? It's too messy for me, let me tidy it up a little bit. So the demon starts detecting the velocities of these guys and says, I'm going to let the, the fast guys to one side, I'm going to let the slow guys 
to the other side and I've created order on one side. They're all nice and slow. The other side is much worse, of course. We know that we have to increase the energy. You can do the same with these guys. You can say, why don't I look at this sample in NMR, the whole sample, and why don't I create a small corner here where all the spins are pointing up at the expense of the rest where all the spins are equally up and down. So rather than all of them being a little bit pure, but mainly mixed, why don't I just completely separate them? I make lots of pure guys, and I make the rest completely mixed. So I, you know, this is useless for, for my experiments, but at least I know that in the left-hand corner of my tube are sitting molecules which can actually do the computation for me. I mean, that would be nice. Uh, so how much can we do in that sense? And I think you don't even, I probably, I probably should expect um, an immediate answer from you without even thinking. Because you know about data compression. You know how much I can compress certain things. So if I start from 10 to the power of 23 atoms with a certain entropy, okay, what's the entropy? P0, P1, okay? So this guy is minus P0 log P0, minus P1 log P1. But how much can I compress it to a maximum in this state? Uh, well, I have to maintain the equality. So I can compress it to something like uh, m, whatever is the number m, times this maximum. So pure state has zero entropy. I don't have to add it to that. This guy has a unit entropy, so times one. Okay. So how many maximally entangled, uh, maximally mixed spins I get is really just the entropy of this guy.